I'm talking about uh, mobile development in humanities. Um, so I actually, I actually am part of the uh, central uh, RSC team at Manchester, um, and, and I lead a, a service within that. So we're probably of a suitable size in Manchester that we uh, we sort of offer sub teams that offer specialist sorts of services. Uh, one of which is is mobile development. Uh, and this came about um, simply because the demand for mobile projects from across the university of the size of Manchester was such that they couldn't really be handled by the, the main ROC team on its own. So it sort of span out into the, what has become, become my team. Uh, and for those of you who will remember from um, um, two, uh, two years ago, uh, yes, the, the N8 meeting in 2019, I, I gave a talk about the service then. So I, I've condensed that talk into one slide just to give you a bit of background as to what this service is. Essentially, we, we, we were established two and a half years ago. Um, we're a team of only three of us, which doesn't sound much, but three people full time, you can get through quite a lot of work. Um, we, we actually have three service offerings now. We, we only started out originally just to develop apps for people. But what we found is our customer base, which is researchers, want one of three things. They either want us to design and build an app for them or they want to do it, but they want us to help them do it. Um, or it, there are one or two teams in the university or other areas that do their own app development that actually just want to publish the app through the university's App Store and Google Play Store accounts. Uh, and because we administer those as well, uh, we can offer that um, service as well. So we try to do all, all three if we can. Uh, in that two and a half years, we've had 26 funded projects uh, to deal with. And... These average from a minimum of around three months to a maximum of around nine to 12 months. So uh, they generally, we never do anything over 12 months in, in length, um, but we, we, we do have a lot of projects on the go at the same time. Um, the developers in the team are, are fr come from a .NET background. Um, I came from a C++ background doing HPC, and, but it was easy enough for me to convert myself to doing C Sharp .NET stuff, which I've basically done in the last three years. Um, so we, our entire tech stack is based on .NET, which, which works very nicely for us. Uh, and we're, we're an agile team, so and we're largely process driven, so which is completely the opposite of a lot of academic projects, actually. So it's, it's quite interesting that we're part of professional services in IT services, and we uh, we do things quite differently to most academic groups, which is makes for some interesting um, relationships with people. But I think we've always delivered, and I think people are happy with that. Uh, we we cover all projects across all faculties, so we don't have any specialism. We just have to do uh, you know jack of all trades. Um, most of the apps we've done in all of in all these faculties are, are generally used for monitoring. Uh, data collection, so monitoring of research participants. Um, we, we've done quite a few where we've built gamified tests for them to the extent that we built a simple cross-platform game engine to help us do this in future. Um, and they use it to maintain engagement with people who are, who are part of research studies. Uh, we mainly build for iOS and Android, and we use a .NET-based cross-platform framework to do it. Um, but it will support quite a lot of other things as well. So we can also build for Windows, for Mac OS, uh, all using the same, same framework. So I'm here to talk about some examples of projects in humanities in particular. Um, so we've done quite a few over the years. So we did one called Sin City, which was basically a knife crime reporting tool. It had a Google Maps integration that people could report instances of, of where they witnessed knife crime in, in London. Um, Drift, which was, was an interesting app I'll say a bit more about later, about uh, supporting um, people in extreme environments. Um, a sort of crop diagnosis tool, uh, which we've done, um, something to help a group, a, a program of students to record their learning, their extracurricular learning activities. So again, it's mainly data collection. Uh, this is like a progress tracking app, this packed app for, for, for parents and children who are on a research program for something like 60, 60 weeks, I think it is quite a long one. Uh, we did a tool for the business school to try to enc encourage mentors to engage with apprentices more. Um, again, trialed on a pilot at the university. Um, LinguaSnap is the one we're working on, or I'm working on at the moment, which is about collecting images of multilingual signs across different cities. 
uh, and then uh, another well-being monitoring tool for urban development. So I, I put these all down because hopefully you can see that none of these appear remotely related, uh, which does make reusing stuff quite hard because uh, everything is practically bespoke. Uh, but this is what researchers want. So we, we prepare apps for them based on what they, what they ask for. So I focused on three in particular. Um, Drift was actually designed to be used and was used on a, on a pilot last year uh, for a group of explorers uh, doing a trek to the Arctic. Um, obviously, the main challenge for things like this is there's no internet connectivity. So you, most apps these days rely on web services to provide everything they do. Uh, we have to embed everything locally in this particular project. Um, I must say they, they had a UI designer design their own appearance of the UI, which we weren't a fan of this two-tone blue. Um, but uh, that, we quite often get that where, where researchers come to us and say, we want it to look exactly like this however awful that might be. And we, we build to spec, essentially. Um, so the idea was it, it was not only providing data collection. So participants using the app had to record their mood. They had to perform a kind of self-assessment. And that data was buffered. And they, they basically had a satellite connection to internet for about an hour a week. And that was the time when the app connected and sent all the data to researchers at the university so they could monitor these things. Um, and we also included some uh, ability for them to monitor their own data via some graphs. So you'll see on, on the right here, we, we had a kind of graphing capability where they could monitor their own stats and, uh, and see whether their mood was high or low. And, and the app actually monitored trends within it. So it, it, it did a kind of, their main goal was to do machine learning, but we didn't get that far. And what we did instead was just produce some simple analysis of their data sets stored on the phone to determine whether they needed to see a video about coping in certain situations. So we embedded a video player in it as well, and that allowed uh, the app to make suggestions to the users and say, you know, you're not, you, you've shown that your mood is dropping in the last three reports, you know, you need, maybe you should watch this video. And these videos were provided by eminent explorers in the field who provided advice. So it's quite an interesting, uh, an interesting project and, and quite a few challenges for us. Uh, we also embedded a psychomotor vigilance test in there. It's like a reaction speed test, which also just sent extra data back to the researchers who were monitoring, monitoring them remotely. Uh, we've got extra funding to do an update for that next year. So that's, that was quite a, quite a big win, that one. Um, the second one I wanted to mention was this crop, crop disease analysis tool. So this was um, uh, designed to be used by farmers in tropical and equatorial regions who essentially don't have very much support when they get problems with crops. So they, they, they don't have the knowledge to hand to diagnose what the problem is or necessarily anything that will help them to treat these crop illnesses. Uh, and, and for a lot of smaller communities, you know, this can be disastrous for, for towns and, and, and villages that rely on these crops for, for survival. So this project, basically, we developed this app. Um, and uh, if people in these communities didn't already have a smartphone, um, then we, 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 they distributed a smartphone to them and they, they used the smartphone or the tablet um, to, to, to report symptoms into our app. And our app basically used the symptoms that they reported to try to match it against the symptom profile of known diseases. So they enter their crop, they enter their disease reports. And then what they would get at the end of it is they'd get a kind of closest match report that says, we think it's 83% likely that your crop has this disease. And then it would load up essentially like a knowledge based page um, to give them advice on how to treat it. Um, and this has been pretty successful. We've got about 350 users of this app across the globe. Um, and, and the software is actually licensed to a university spin out, which is called Agro.Limited, which is actually their primary tool that they, they sell. So that, that turned out to be quite a successful uh, product from a commercial perspective as well. And then the final one I wanted to mention. Um, is, is a project called LinguaSnap. This has been around actually a while. It was developed originally using a very old mobile web technology called jQuery Mobile. Um, and, and it's basically those, those, that version of the app is being remote, taken down by the bots of Google and Apple because of security concerns. So we've been rebuilding it in our .NET stack. Uh, and there are three sort of flavors of this. So there's one called LinguaSnap Manchester, which is the purple one, of course. And then there's LinguaSnap Jerusalem and LinguaSnap Melbourne. Uh, and they all connect to a backend data service. 
Um, it's not the same one we use for our main data collection that was managed by uh, the RSC team. This is a, a one they built bespoke for this particular project. Um, and essentially people can go around the city and if they notice uh, by a multilingual signs, they can take a picture of it and then they fill in some metadata and then they can upload that picture to, to these LinguaSAP servers where the data is uh, vetted and viewed by researchers and then hosted on a public website. So you've got a public website as part of the, part of the, the process as well that dis displays these images and this metadata for the general public. So it's considered largely a community outreach sort of project, even though uh, it is sort of funded by, by research funding. Uh, the interesting thing for us is, is we were able to do something reasonably cool in, in Visual Studio, which was to, rather than having three different repositories of the same code, largely the same code with just some branding changes, which I'm sad to say was how the original was developed. Uh, we just have one uh, repository and then we actually add, we build in the branding using build customization. So you can, you can select a build configuration uh, within Visual Studio and it essentially will rebuild that particular flavor of your, of your app um, from the same common code. So from a maintainability perspective, um, we learned a lot from that and, and it's, it's been a, a big win on how to, to just not duplicate effort, just clean code principles and, and best practice. So in conclusion then, um, what, what I would say about mobile projects in the humanities, more so, definitely more so than um, science and engineering or, or biology, medicine and health, um, they are massively varied. I think at our university, it's basically science and engineering, um, biology, medicine and health and everything else is basically how they, they divvy up the faculties. And the everything else basically can just be anything. We can get asked to do absolutely anything with, with an app. Uh, so it's very, very varied in their requirements. Almost all of them have a data collection and storage requirement where they want to collect data, they want to store it, they want to process it and access it as researchers. And we provide the infrastructure to them to do that out of the box. And using a consistent tech stack, we also have a library that just plugs straight into our apps. So we can do that very, very quickly. And uh, we, we have come across some instances of people engaging external app companies who really, really make hard work about doing what would take us a day. Uh, so hopefully, you know, we, we don't we don't aim to to say don't use external app companies, but we we often help those external app companies use our systems. But it is frustrating for us when we know that we have something that's ready to go already. Um, and I would say if you are considering doing mobile projects or you get mobile projects within the NA group, um, then the, the mechanisms for managing and deploying mobile projects are quite unique. So they do need careful consideration and, and we are policed by quite a careful governance procedure as well. Um, so we, 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 they do need proper consideration and management. Uh, and one final point, which I think will feed into the discussions later actually is, um, I remember saying this two years ago as well, is if for some N8 groups and some smaller RSE teams, it's just not viable to have a mobile service and they quite often turn away mobile projects. Um, one of the things I've been looking to, into recently is, is it possible for uh, Manchester as an N8 member, could we do some of these projects for other institutions, other members of N8? And if so, how would a charge model look for that? And, and this was the sticking point two years ago when I brought it up, is nobody knew how we would cost it, whether VAT was involved, et cetera. But in the last couple of years, we've done projects for either external organisations, external funders, or um, other universities, in fact, this year, um, just not, not UK universities. And we have found a way to invoice them. And we often invoice them our salary costs only, which is our kind of trump card as a central RSC team, is we don't charge overheads for things. So I think if there's a suitable collaboration in place, I don't see why we can't do it. So I've asked the question um, and I'll hopefully update this community at some point and we get an answer as to whether we can uh, offer those services to the RNA members. Okay, that's it for me. Yeah, this is a really good question. So, so we have a formal process for capturing requirements and, and capturing requests for mobile apps and just RSEs in general in our team. Uh, and one of those is we have to have a discussion around maintenance. Uh, we also have a um, quite, as I said, quite a carefully governed uh, process for releasing apps through the stores. 
and, and that we have a standard essentially that people have to conform to and um and, and that standard basically states there has to be an arrangement in place for maintenance and sometimes that arrangement can be we don't have an arrangement uh, and if that's true, then you know it, it's very it's been it's very transparent and very clear up front that we will not maintain apps for you for nothing. So um, projects that have funding and they're all they're always always funded um, that they, they they would have to allocate a bunch of money to for us to maintain it for a period that they specify, and that would be to do you know whatever maintenance required. However, um, there is obviously those scenarios where. Um, apps are on the stores, they have a security problem, or there is something that requires a mandatory update, then there's no funding available. That happens as well. And what we do in those instances, and we basically say, um, you know, either have to go away and find some money, it's going to cost this much to patch it. Um, and if you can't patch it, we'll have to remove it. Um, so for, for those in the know, I suppose, um, in two days time, there's a deadline for all apps on stores uh, developed by public sector bodies to have accessibility statements and accessibility testing. Now we had to patch five of our apps and um, only two of them had funding allocated to do it. So we basically said to them, if you can't find the money, we'll have to take it down. And, and it's basically a discussion. They basically said, well, we can't, we can't find the money, but we desperately need this app where it's going to damage our research. So you know, we just did it. We just did it for them for nothing. And we basically said, we'll do it for you, but it would go to the back of our queue. Uh, so we'll do it before the deadline, but it'll go to the back of our queue behind people who pay. So we have a kind of priority system, I suppose.